All right, we'll um we'll begin. Um good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who's um taken the time to join us, as I know that many of you may be in different time zones. Welcome to this important and timely event hosted by the Conservative Friends of Afghanistan. It is my honor to serve as your moderator today today for a discussion that holds significant implications, not just for Afghanistan, but for the global community. Today's topic will focus on the Taliban and the future of the state in Afghanistan, and particularly the West's policy towards the country. In August 2021, the world witnessed a monumental shift in Afghanistan's history. Following NATO's withdrawal, the Taliban swiftly took control of the country, ending two decades of efforts to establish a democratic governance system. This takeover has had profound implications, reshaping not only the political landscape of Afghanistan, but also the, impacting the daily lives of its people. Under the Taliban's rule, Afghanistan has faced numerous challenges, most notably severe human rights violations. The plight of women in particular, as many of you have seen, has been deeply concerning. The hard earned progress in women's rights over the past two decades is being eroded, as women are increasingly excluded from public life, education and employment. These developments have not only humanitarian implications, but also raise questions about the future of governance and society in Afghanistan. There have been many reports circulating on the manner in which the Taliban are governing the country. The Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, Sigar, has stated the Taliban have been benefiting from donor-funded education assistance in Afghanistan through nefarious methods. For example, establishing fraudulent NGOs and extorting and infiltrating existing NGOs to ob obtain and direct international donor aid towards certain locations and towards a certain audience. There have been reports from UN member states that the Taliban have committed campaigns of ethnic cleansing uh, by forcefully evicting thousands of ethnic Tajiks, Hazaras, Uzbeks from their homes, beating and killing them and burning down uh, their, their, their property. Other human rights reports have stated that the Taliban have arbitrarily imprisoned more than 17,000 people, including children as wow. young as 12. Shockingly, the prison population is disproportionately made up of Tajiks detained on political charges. So as we delve into our discussion today, we aim to shed light on the complexities of this situation. We'll explore the dynamics of the Taliban's governance, the international community's response, and the broader implications for global politics and human rights. Our focus will be to understand the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead for Afghanistan, as well as the role of the West in shaping the future of this pivotal region. It's a conversation of great importance, and we're fortunate to have with us Professor Thomas Barfield, a distinguished expert on Afghanistan, to guide us through these intricate issues. So it's my honor to introduce our esteemed guest. He brings a wealth of knowledge and insight, having extensively studied and written about Afghanistan and its political history, culture, and societal dynamics. His expertise is not just academic, but it's enriched by deep understanding of the region's complexities. Professor Barfield's perspective are, perspectives are invaluable in shedding light on the current situation, but also the future prospects of Afghanistan under Taliban rule. Welcome, Professor Barfield. Thank you very much. Let's start with neighboring dynamics. Uh, as we have heard in the last two or three weeks, Pakistan has decided to deport almost two million refugees to Afghanistan, amongst uh, which are men and women, 
who fled the country in August 2021 for safety. Um, in your opinion, how does Pakistan's deportation policies impact Afghanistan, especially under the Taliban regime? And could could you elaborate a little bit on the geographical, uh, also geopolitical and humanitarian implications of these policies on Afghanistan, especially if there have been un, um, verified reports that have been circulating on whether many of those who have been being deported are actually from Afghanistan and not Pakistani uh, uh, residents of Pashtun uh, ethnic groups who are uh, migrating to Afghanistan together with the rest of the deportees. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about your your views on this subject. Sure, the relationship between Afghanistan and Pakistan is a very complicated one. Um, and it's often been uh, subject to tension particularly because no Afghan government has ever recognized the Durand line. That was a line drawn by the British in 1893 that separated uh, British India from Afghanistan. Its impact on Afghanistan was to cut the Pashtun ethnic group pretty much in half. And so the Northwest Frontier province of Pakistan, part of Balochistan, um, that fell under British rule, contained the same people, the Pashtun people, some Baluch people, um, they were also resident and had formerly been under the rule of, of Afghanistan. Uh, the Afghans recognized this frontier, and they called it a frontier, as a de facto border, but they never accepted it as legitimate. And particularly when the British withdrew from India, uh, the Indian subcontinent in 1947, the Afghans argued <clears throat> that this boundary should be renegotiated, because after all, it was with the British and not with Pakistan. Why did Pakistan deserve to control all of these Pashtun people who had not given had not been given a choice about where they wanted to go in the post-partition world? Uh, in particular, the partition was simply between uh, a Pakistan, which at that time included the East, today Bangladesh, uh, and India. And the Afghans said, "Well, the Pashtun should have an op you know an opportunity either to be independent, join with Afghanistan. Uh, it shouldn't be a binary." choice. This was ignored. It was made part of, of Pakistan. But the Pakistani government never extended its formal rule inside the Northwest Frontier province, remain keeping the sort of the British colonial status of using political agents. Now, from 1947, a goal of Pakistan has been to get Afghan governments to recognize that as a border, an international border. The Afghans could say it was arbitrary, but so is their border with Iran, so is their border with Russian Central Asia, none of which have come into dispute, even though they have the same kind of cross-ethnic uh, difficulties. And this has been a remarkably consistent policy in Afghanistan. The monarchy refused to accept it. Dawood's Republic refused to accept it. The communists refused to accept it. The Mujahideen refused to accept it. The Islamic Republic of Afghanistan for the past 20 years has refused to accept it. And the Taliban have also refused. This came as a shock to Pakistan because it has spent 20 years arming the Taliban in the hopes of taking over Afghanistan so they would have a client or at least a friendly regime. And the friendliest thing a regime could do would be to recognize the Duran line and end this more than 100 year conflict. The Taliban refused. So. In some senses, after putting all of this investment in the Taliban, the Pakistanis found they didn't have an ally in Kabul. They had a potential enemy, uh, one that did not recognize the border, uh, one that was allowing the sanctuary of tariq -e taliban Pakistani Taliban, inside Afghanistan, many of whom were attacking across the border into, into Pakistan. So when they, when they looked at it, um, what they thought they were getting didn't turn out. And it's really striking the Taliban regime in the 1990s, while it was recognized by only three countries, Pakistan, the UAE, and Saudi Arabia. The UAE and Saudi Arabia closed their embassies pretty soon. This regime has not been recognized by a single country, not even Pakistan. Pakistan helped put it into power, and yet Pakistan has, it deals with it as a de facto government, but has not given it diplomatic recognition. So what we're seeing here is an attempt uh, on a really frustrated attempt to Pakistan to use crude levers to influence the Taliban by saying, we're going to deport a million and a half Afghans. 
sending them back to a country that's whose economy has collapsed, uh, where work opportunities were there, and particularly sending women back to you know certain seclusion and lack of work, many of whom have, are educated or worked in Pakistan. But you raise an important problem is how do you even define these people? It's very easy to say, all right, the people that came over in 2021, they're recent refugees. They came in either illegally or they've overstayed their Pakistan visas. So they qualify as undocumented. But people often forget that the world's largest refugee flow in the 1980s was from Afghanistan. Three million Afghans entered Pakistan during the Soviet war period. They were granted asylum there in refugee camps, but their status was never formalized. They were like refugees. Now we've seen this in other parts of the world where Palestinians are considered refugees in Egypt, Lebanon, Syria, even though they've been there for generations. The same thing has happened in Pakistan is that many of the Afghans that the Pakistanis claim are undocumented and need to be report, deported back to their home country were born in Pakistan. Sometimes their grandfathers were born in Pakistan. Technically, they may have been Afghans. Some of those Afghans have Pakistani status, but many do not. And yet they've never known Afghanistan. They've never been there for generations. So this is a mass deportation, but one that um, uses the excuse of people who do not have status to deport people who essentially the Pakistani government has accepted as residents for 20, 30, 40 years. And this creates an, a second enormous problem is most of these people who fled to Pakistan were ethnic Pashtuns, the same kind of people that live in the Northwest frontier. So we're not talking about sort of an alien group. They, they are the same group of people that live on both sides of the frontier. And this is where the Afghans say, we don't recognize that border. Who are you to take these people out of their homeland and shift them to us just because of an artificial border? The question is, from Pakistan's point of view, is it's a policy failure. If you have to use this crude lever, it shows you're at your wit's end in terms of dealing with the Taliban. But it's also potentially highly ineffective because the Taliban can simply respond as they have in the past, refugees are not our problem. Maybe the UN will feed them. Maybe not our problem. We don't care how many millions of people you send. We don't care how bad their conditions are. But think about the trouble this is going to cause inside Afghanistan. I sorry, inside Pakistan. Pakistan already has enough political problems. Talking about in any country deporting a million and a half people, many of whom were born there, that's a difficult kind of situation. Britain has that kind of situation. The United States has millions of people that are undocumented. The United States, however, has birthright citizenship. Uh, illegal immigrants who have children in the United States, their kids are automatically citizens. That's a problem. It doesn't, your status problem is solved if you're born in this country. Pakistan and most other countries don't. But what we're looking at is a Pakistan government now attacking the regime that it put into power and one of the responses of the Taliban, well, if you're going to be this way, maybe we should, whatever we're doing to kind of dissuade tariq -e taliban and other anti-Islamabad political parties, maybe we should help them out. We've got plenty of weapons. Uh, we have many of our own Afghan-born people who would like to fight a jihad now that the war has ended in Afghanistan. Their Pakistani counterparts say, why not Islamabad? So... It's not clear that this threat of deportation is a solution to a problem, but rather uh, the beginnings of a, of a bigger one. Thank you, Professor. Um, moving on to a, another critical issue, humanitarian aid. Um, there are moral and logistical dilemmas here in providing aid to a Taliban-led government. Um, how do you think the international community could navigate this complex issue, ensuring that aid reaches uh, the, the people of, of Afghanistan without inadvertently legitimizing or empowering the Taliban regime? The question of foreign aid for Afghanistan is, is an essential one. 
<clears throat> because throughout Afghanistan's history, its government has survived on foreign aid, foreign loans, foreign educational support, foreign medical support, going back to its time of modernization in the 1950s and 60s. There it got the Soviet Union to pay for part, the United States to pay for the part. So this is a really, uh, it's a long tradition of Afghan governments seeking outside aid to carry out a lot of government services rather than tax their own people or carry it out themselves. Uh, and this type of policy was exacerbated in the 20 years of the Republic since 2001, because when the Republic fell, the World Bank said that 42% of its GDP was foreign aid. A country that has that percentage, close to half of your entire GDP comes from outsiders. One can easily see when a lot of that aid was withdrawn after the Taliban came to power, it created an immediate crisis. The UN has practically the entire country living in dire poverty. But the interesting thing is that while it may not be 42%, the aid that did remain in Afghanistan fed Afghans, particularly the United Nations did this. It supported education and to some extent healthcare. If we look at the civil war in Afghanistan between the Taliban and the Republic, one of the interesting facets of that was as the Taliban took more and more territory from the government in the years leading up to their successful seizure of Kabul, one of the interesting things they did was they retained all of the government employees in the provinces and districts that they ruled and allowed them to receive their salaries from Kabul because they provided services. So essentially, the Republic paid for services like education, like health care, um, in Taliban-controlled territories. The only thing the Taliban really ran themselves was a court system. Uh, they were famous for that. But in essence, they outsourced to NGOs and to uh, the Kabul government what we would consider the normal functions of government, taking care of the people. That meant they could focus on the war and not worry about issues of governance. Once they became in charge, they still, strangely enough, although they were keen to get all the foreigners out, they wanted the foreigners to leave their money and aid behind. And this happened to be a repeat of uh, the Taliban government in the 1990s. It was the UN that fed the people of Kabul, even though they could not stand Taliban policies. And the Taliban criticized the international community for saying they have un-Islamic values, they're not Muslims, but at the same time, they needed the aid. It was like a very bad marriage, okay? They didn't divorce because who's gonna take care of the children? And this has always created um, a problem for international agencies is to what extent that by taking over functions of government, particularly feeding the population, which is a humanitarian imperative, we do not want innocent people to starve. We have an obligation. So the UN, other donors, EU, parts of the United States, put in at least two, maybe three billion dollars feeding people. But that relieves the Taliban of the responsibility of doing it. To what extent then do, is even, even if the Taliban were not taking a single dollar from international agencies or NGOs, which is not true, they are siphoning off some of the money. But even if they were perfectly honest and no, we're not gonna do this, fundamentally, we have the international community keeping Afghanistan stable so the Taliban can carry out rules that the international agencies that are feeding the Afghan population find reprehensible. And in some ways counterproductive. When the Taliban has told the UN and others, you cannot have women working for you, right? Afghanistan is a gender segregated society in rural areas. And the Taliban are certainly from that milieu. Even in the 1990s, they never went that far because how do you service widows and orphans to feed them? You can't send men to say, how many widows are here? How many orphans? I, I need to see where this... No, that's considered absolutely culturally inappropriate. Even if it was separate, you had to have women in NGOs to deal with half of the population just by Afghan culture. It's not appropriate for strange men to be asking these questions to meeting with. 
so even the old Taliban was, well, of course you have to have women to do this, you know, and it was never, they might want segregated offices or say, we want these, but they, and from their own cultural values, you need to do this. The Taliban, and I won't call them new Taliban because many of these guys were around, um, and they all are guys, uh, were around in the 1990s, but they become much more hardline, saying, no, we don't need any of this at all. Uh, which actually means they actually don't understand even how to get their population fed by the international community and are playing this game of chicken saying, you'll do whatever we say because you're afraid the Afghans will starve. This is a very dangerous thing because at what point will the U UN particularly, but the EU, Britain, the US, throw up its hands and say, we cannot work under these conditions. We are pulling out. It's not our responsibility. And given the number of international crises in the world, it's easy for a disaster in Afghanistan to get lost, right? So the, the Taliban are playing a very dangerous game, but they probably don't even realize they're playing that game because fundamentally they believe that humanitarianism will override whatever ideology they're doing because the consequences of that actually mean more to the international community than they mean to the Taliban. Uh, there's a incredibly important quotes that you shared with us, something that we don't often hear about the relationship between Pakistan and Afghanistan, uh, but also the elements around humanitarian aid and where, where the Taliban uh, draw the line. Um, moving on to sort of divisions within the Taliban, because you've you've alluded quite a lot in terms of the dynamics of the kind of group that, that this is. But as you know, the Taliban are often viewed as a monolithic entity um, and it has its own internal divisions and factions so i'd love to hear a little bit more about um what these divisions are um and, and the, the, imp the impact that these divisions are having on the governance and the policies of the taliban um, and how these internal dynamics affect their dealings with the west um, and neighboring countries this is a very interesting question, and it's one that I hesitate to speak definitively because it's very opaque. So consider this to be more speculation, uh, informed commentary, and not real analysis, right? The Taliban had factions, but every Afghan government or movement has had factions. The communists had the Parchamis and the Halkis. They were at each other's throats, even as they were fighting the Mujahideen. The Mujahideen fighting the Soviets had seven recognized parties in Pakistan with seven autonomous leaders. Most recently, the Republic was divided between Ashraf Ghani and Chief Executive Officer Abdullah. In the midst of a war, it's divided, and during the Trump administration, it almost split when Ghani and Abdullah, for a short period of time, both declared themselves president. So when we're looking at divisions, I don't care what the ideology is, this is this is sort of the status quo in Afghanistan in terms of politics. What the divisions are, where how they come about, their influence, that changes. But we can almost always count that they're going to be divisions. Um, if we look at the Taliban, what we see is a very their very quick takeover of Kabul actually probably upset a longer term strategy that they were negotiating in Doha. And if they had come to a negotiation and come into government, they could have dominated, even been the government, they, but they probably wouldn't have lost the international aid because it would have been, quote, by agreement. Um, taking over militarily, they have the problem that the Republic had, that the PDPA communists had, is that every power in Afghanistan that takes control of Kabul, rules the entire country in a sudden burst, whether it was a coup um, in 1978 by the communists, uh, or whether it was the Republic post-2001, what we see is any group that seizes, seizes power militarily feels that it doesn't need to negotiate with its rivals. We want, we can do anything we want. The Taliban were the same in the 1990s. We want everything. We set the rules. And then when things get to go bad, we discover, governments discover, 
it's not so easy to do. So if we look at this fast, and it was really fast, take over Afghanistan by the Taliban. One of the interesting things about it, we, we could see at least four factions. There was the old Taliban, which you might call the Quetta Shura, uh, the people that had descendants sometimes of, and sometimes actual members of the old Taliban government, largely based in Kandahar, very conservative. Then we found the Haqqani network, very much tied to Pakistan's ISI, linked to Al Qaeda. But the important thing to realize there is the Haqqanis were Zajan Pashtuns. I mean, they had been allied with the Taliban, but they were not formed on the basis of religion. That's sort of based on tribe ethnicity in Afghanistan, sort of the politics of Northwest Frontier and Afghanistan. It, you could be highly religious, but its leaders were not mullahs. They were, they were separate. But the most interesting part of look at how Kabul fell. It fell with attacks from the north, Mazar Sharif, Herat. These cities fell, and the troops moved in on Kabul. If you were sort of thinking about the Taliban and where their strength was, the main attack should have been from Kandahar and Jalalabad, right? I mean, that's the Pashtun area. That was the old conservative heartland. We would think you mobilize your base and then move on Kabul. Who took Kabul from them? Essentially, is they got their most impetus when they managed to turn northern Afghanistan, which was historically northern alliance country, anti-Taliban country, where Pashtuns are a minority. It was these places that fell first. And the Taliban there were more diverse. Yeah, maybe they were probably mostly Pashtuns, but they also had Uzbeks, they had Turkmen, they had Tajiks. So it was multi-ethnic. They also, the Taliban up there, were much more liberal. Their concern about whether girls go to school, that was never one of their concerns. Even today, uh, I have colleagues of mine that help support girls' schools in northern Afghanistan, and they, they get permission of Taliban leaders to set these things up. You know, The ministry, or Kandahar may say, impossible, but the locals do. Uh, a student of mine who returned uh, to visit Herat in uh, eight months ago, uh, told me that all the Taliban there appeared to be Haratis. So one of the questions that comes up is, right now things are stable, but at least these four interest groups have a different base, they have different ideologies, and the people who are calling the shots, particularly in terms of policies oppressing women, are these old guys in Kandahar. That's an old issue for them. It does not appear to be the, if you will, the Zajani dominated government in Kabul that occupies the Ministry of Interior, a lot of the military, they look like they're quite willing to compromise on that if it brings in aid. They're very practical because it's not a big issue for them. And it also doesn't seem to be a really big issue in the North and the West. So if it looks like things are going to crash, could there be an internal conflict inside Afghanistan? of the Taliban that say, you're, you know, any radical regime that wins power, the West always assumes, well, they become more moderate when they take power. History has shown that, no, they become more radical. We've won, let's go for something even bigger. But Afghanistan is, what you have won is not necessarily a cohesive thing. So it may well be that the people who are running the government in Kabul look upon Kandahar where sort of the spiritual heartland is, um, is you guys shouldn't be setting policies. And then there's a question, what happens when revenue begins running short? The Taliban from the North and West said, we were the people that you know brought down the Republic. If you didn't have us, you guys would still be besieging God. Um, so where's our share? And in particular, if there's a push more toward defining the Taliban as a Pashtun nationalist kind of group, the people that joined the, the, the Taliban who were not Pashtuns are gonna, that's not, that's not in their interests. So at the moment, we don't see anything happening. But the interesting thing about Afghanistan is that it appears really stable until it's not. And then what we as academics and others will explain to you 10 years later why whatever happened was inevitable. I mean, how did Afghanistan ever become a communist country? I mean, it's like, 
that was not, you know, nobody ever anticipated the United States and NATO would go into Afghanistan. Who could have predicted that? Nobody would have predicted that Joe Biden would simply say, I'm just getting out, let the place collapse. The consensus in Washington and in the EU and NATO, I, I should say, was things are not good in Afghanistan, but we can probably keep that stalemate running for another 10 years. Sudden collapse. In retrospect, people say, oh, these things were all inevitable. So one of the things looking at the Taliban that we really don't know right now is that we usually see fractures and other, we, we come to appreciate them only in periods of crises. Those are very difficult to predict. Um, thank you, Professor Barfield. Um, you've somewhat alluded to this already, but as you know, one of the most distressing aspects of the Taliban's rule uh, and one that has uh, reached international audiences has been its impact on women and girls, specifically re regarding education and some of the most um, their most basic human rights. And as you know, since their takeover, the Taliban have impose severe restrictions, including a ban on girls' education, uh, going to school, university. Um, whilst, like you said, history has, has shown us that when a, an extremist uh, group is in power, they do not change. They actually become a lot more harsher. And and there is already similarities that we've seen in just the last two, two years from this Taliban and, and the ones that were ruling in the late 1990s. But I'd love to know a little bit more of you, about your insight on the rationale behind the Taliban's decision to restrict women's rights, not only religiously, but what other motives could be uh, at play here? Can they be using these restrictions as a bargaining tool for international legitimacy or other political gains? And how do these policies impact Afghanistan's social and political landscape? Uh, I mean, what, what future do they uh, see for women and girls in the country in the long run if they do, uh, if they see some, a, a future where they actually end up staying in power for much longer? That's a very interesting question. And to, to some extent, particularly coming out of Kandahar, which sets the policies, this fixation on women um, is really hard to explain. In, in, in some ways, um, because it's highly destructive to the economy, right? Over the past 20 years, millions of women were educated. They held out jobs. Um, and in a country that lost many men to wars, either they were killed or they became handicapped, uh, one of the things that happened over the past 20 years is that many families began to appreciate that their educated daughters could work and bring in money. They became breadwinners. That was not something, you know, if you look back 50 years, that wasn't sort of an option given the way the economy and other things were, were going. Uh, so I think the attitude in Afghanistan changed over time and the Taliban never did. It's, it's a, this gender segregation, this concern about it, it's dominant. I mean, they partially explain it in religion, but look at the Islamic Republic in Iran. Right? They, there, you have enormous gender problems, particularly over the Chador. But Iranian women make up a huge percent of the economy. I mean, Iran could not function without women in the economy. And I believe in Iran, women make up the majority university classes and other, including conservative, I mean, religious universities. One irony of the um, uh, the Islamic Republic was they made it safe for conservative families to send their daughters to conservative universities because now there was a feeling that it was an appropriate path for them to go. There are ways this could have been done in Afghanistan, but it appears to me that uh, uh, the, that the Taliban leadership um, they're mostly old men and they're incredibly conservative. And why they have this, why this fixation on women, maybe that's because I'm getting old myself. I do not understand why, you know, even within Afghan culture, there's ways to work this out. You could have gender apartheid, separate but equal. That is reprehensible, but you could have women working banning them from universities as opposed to setting up segregated class, you know, 
it's going it's going beyond i think the pra not only the practical it's destructive so i don't think I, they're not doing it as a bargaining chip right because it's apparent that even their own ministry of education doesn't know what the policy is they they literally opened girls schools and closed them on a day on the same day because they got word from kandahar that never mind we're not doing that that's you know the government doesn't know what the political decision makers are going to do but i think the the bigger thing that's misunderstood is that they misunderstand is the afghanistan that they're ruling is not the afghanistan that they left in the 1990s um the majority of afghans were born since 2001 right for 20 years girls have gone to school they become doctors they become lawyers they entered government to close that down when only 12 percent of your population is over 55 how does you know you have destroyed the future of a young generation that's a majority in afghanistan and also the whole question, if these are sort of rural values, and I, I would not say they're universal rural values, even in rural areas, people in the North and West, they're more liberal than this. But what we see is it's women had made the most progress in the cities and that's where they're really, the Taliban are really focusing. So they're essentially trying to destroy a culture. And one of the ways to do it, one of the great symbols Going back to Amanola in the 1920s, people forget that women in Afghanistan got the vote before American women did in the 1920s. Because Amanola's policies on women and women's liberation, particularly Queen Soraya, who was in charge of the education ministry, this was an Afghan initiative, it wasn't a foreign initiative. This, this has been for 100 years a problem in Afghanistan, and there's by no means consensus on it. And they are coming down hardest on a generation that is least sympathetic to Taliban values. And the question of that is, okay, you're stable now. At which point are you, are you going to create a crisis? Certainly the Taliban could not have expected it didn't happen in the past when the Taliban took over. There were women demonstrating in the streets against them. Kabul had never seen anything like that. Politics, particularly public politics, that's, that's a male domain. That the women were out there. And we saw a similar thing in Iran. Times change, people change. And one of the questions, even in terms of, of Taliban supporters, they have daughters too. And many of them are thinking, well, what is my daughter's future? Or even if you think in sort of gendered terms, you need women doctors. You need, you need a whole class of people. Even if you wanna do gender segregation, you need a whole class of people to service half the population. And they're making it impossible. So I see it as something that's um, counterproductive domestically, and it is certainly counterproductive internationally, because it's one of the it's one of the key things when you think about it. And I'm sure some of the Taliban and Kabul are thinking about it. You let a few ten thousand uh, number of women go to high schools and colleges, and the international international coalition gets off your back. They can say, "Hey, that's a really small price." To there's not many women that are going, all right? Let's do it. And this, this absolute ban makes it much easier for the international community to sort of see the Taliban as a group they cannot deal with. It's much harder to deal with someone that's extremely repressive, but is giving a little bit to say, yeah, we show, we have your concern. And somebody says, yeah, but it only advantages 10% of the population. Just quickly, before I move on to the next question, um, I want to take in one from the audience where they've asked, do you really believe that the West does not have the influence or leverage to push the Taliban to form either an inclusive governance system or respect human and women's rights? Yes, I do. I, I, you know, the, because when the Taliban have been challenged, like people will starve, their leader said, God feeds people. That's not our responsibility. This is really old. I mean, modern states provide security. They feed their people. They provide medical care. Pre-modern states had armies. God takes care of feeding people. 
God decides who's going to live, who's going to die. And the Taliban really is, they're pretty modern in that sense. How do you put leverage on people who really don't care? Even if you say, you know, this could create political unrest. They really don't. I, I, as I say, the people who are making there are Taliban that yes, that might be possible. But I've been asked, I've been asked about moderate Taliban, I think since 1997 or eight. Every time I visited Washington at that time, which is early the pre 9-11 Bush administration, people would say, do you think we can deal with moderate Taliban? You know, where are the moderate Taliban? And every people are all, you know, it's wishful thinking. Are there moderate Taliban? Maybe, but they're certainly not in influential positions. Are there practical Taliban? More likely than, than moderate. But I don't believe if the Taliban have no interest in forming not only, you know, in the women's policies, but they've done zero in terms of inclusivity in their government. Look at their ministries. They're almost exclusively pushed in. And that's a much bigger problem in a country that has powerful regional ethnic groups. No group is a majority inside Afghanistan, but if you go to the West, if you go to the North, those are not Pashtun areas, right? So historically ways have been just to be practical. Let's bring some of these people into government. They need representation. Just if you're thinking about patronage, um, the Taliban have been remarkably um, insensitive. Yes, I mean, really, I think one of the things that is on everyone's mind when it comes to Afghanistan, uh, particularly what we've seen over the last two years. Uh, and I'll move on to another subject in a second, but the matter of whether the US and the West has any power or influence over using leverage to influence and uh, in assist in the process of ensuring that the Taliban can lift some of these restrictions is there really nothing that can be done because that's the question that's on everyone's mind and that that's exactly the answer that a lot of people constantly hear when there are pleas for help what we're hearing from this side of the world is well there's nothing we can do because it's in the hands of the taliban is that really the case well as i mentioned earlier you know friends of mine that help support girls schools in northern afghanistan what you discover is that the hard line doesn't necessarily exist all over Afghanistan. So one of the questions is, are you going to get the Taliban to change its policy, the Taliban as Taliban state? But another thing is, all right, we won't work with these hardline Taliban, but we will work with those that are more sympathetic to our interests. And there, I think that is a possibility. I, I, I think the mistake of Afghanistan is always assuming a unitary government can enforce its will, whatever it is. The communists tried, um, the Taliban in the 90s tried, the Republic pretended that we control everything, but we kind of saw that it didn't. The Taliban are in a similar position. In Afghanistan, so much of the politics is local and it's a question of, you know, if you're in the North or the West, you're in, it's a different Afghanistan than if you're in Kandahar or Nangarhar. So one of the questions would be, um, perhaps we should not focus on getting the Taliban as a government to change its mind, but sort of to think about undermining its control by Taliban in one area saying, well, these guys got all this aid and we don't. And they, why is the answer? It's because they help open girls' schools, okay? They don't follow these policies. We're not going to aid you because you don't. Um, um, and really picking up on that point about supporting change from within. Um, as you know, there have been small factions within uh, Afghanistan, resistance groups that have been uh, trying to fight against the Taliban's authority uh, and in some ways uh, using platforms to over overthrow or provide uh, a, a different uh, opinion of what Afghanistan wants, uh, an opposition 
uh, and in many ways a democratic one. I mean, we've seen the National Resistance Front um, quite uh, active in in this way, and there are other diaspora sort of led um, those in exile who are for, forming movements. Do you think there's any uh, legitimacy to, to groups like this, and and in what way do you think the West can support? Um, opposition groups is that even is there even an appetite for this? I mean, we saw Tom uh, Thomas West uh, um, from the U.S. who recently stated that uh, the U.S. is not supporting any sort of military uh, resistance groups in Afghanistan. If, and if that's the case, what other solutions are there to help change, uh, sort of become something credible uh, inside the country? Well. With all due respect to the American government, it didn't support, didn't give any military aid to anti-Taliban groups during the 1990s. And then suddenly when it needed it, it said, oh, well, these groups are around, now we'll support them. Um, American policy tends to blow either 100%, we're doing everything, or we're doing nothing. They didn't understand Afghanistan after being there for 20 years. I don't expect them to understand a more complicated Afghanistan now. One of the problems I think we need to be careful of, which we weren't in the Republic, is the relationship in the diaspora and on the people inside. It's very easy to be radical on the outside, say we've got to do X, Y, and Z. People on the inside, they've got everyday life to deal with. Alexis de Tocqueville noted that revolutions did not occur during periods of intense crisis, poverty, we talked about revolution of rising expectations. It was when things got better that people said, why are we living like this? You know? And so one of the things these groups do is right now they may look impotent. They may look like, why are they even there? You have to realize if I was, if you were to ask me this question about the Taliban in 2003, 2004, they could never come back. They don't exist, right? But their opportunity came and they took it. The same kind of thing happens for resistance groups. But one of the things that has to be is they're not likely to be diaspora led. One of the problems of the Republic was that many people inside Afghanistan felt that its government was too heavily uh, staffed with diaspora and that they didn't, they did not, under, particularly Ashraf Ghani, did not understand how Afghanistan works. They were too ideological or, or they, they had programs. And in Afghanistan, Afghanistan has been a victim of more people's programs than any group of people has a right to expect. They were victims of communism. Then they became victims of radical Islamism. And then we had 20 years of a democracy, but it was a democracy that had an elected king um, called the president. But there was very little feedback in terms of do Afghans get to choose their own governors? Do they get to decide what the policy is? No. So one of the things to look at on here is that to what extent opposition to Af Af Afghanistan comes up internally. When the opportunity arises, these groups, they may, became, they may become the focus of a movement that takes off. And that's, that's a very important kind of thing. But one of the things that I've been looking at is we're focused even today on Afghan insurgencies equal rural insurgencies. That's where they always are, the countryside versus the cities. But the Taliban represent this sort of rural vision of Afghanistan, now ruling over cities. When they left Kabul, it was, it was a city that was completely destroyed, God knows, maybe half million, 700,000 people. 2001, today four or five million. Iraq, Kandahar, Mazar, also very large urban centers with very young populations. If there's going to be an insurgency in Afghanistan, it's more likely to resemble um, the Arab Spring, where frustrated youth who don't necessarily have a political agenda at the time express their opposition. And then it's a question, does the Taliban see them as legitimate kind of, yeah, we've got to consider this, 
or do they go in militarily, let's say Syria uh, or others, and say, we're just going to wipe them out? In which case, could the, you know, could the Taliban hold Kabul, four or five million people who don't much like them, with 10,000 troops, many of whom don't even speak Persian, they're from the countryside? Um, that would be, uh, you know, a, that would be a type of insurgency, a type of rebellion that we've never seen in Afghanistan because Afghanistan never had cities before. So one of the things to look at, young population thrown into poverty, their futures have been ruined by a Taliban government. And right now, people are very concerned about how do we, how do we live? How do we get through this? But at a certain time, those frustrations could bubble up, and they're not likely to bubble up in the mountains of Badakhshan or in the Hazarajat. They're likely to occur in places like Mazar or Kabul or even Jalalabad. If that happens, all hell could break loose, and at which point the question would be, maybe the Taliban don't really control this country. Right? And that tends to be governments in Afghanistan tend to fall almost instantaneously when there's a belief they can't hold on to power. In retrospect, it's easy to say, okay, this is where it happened. Right now, would I predict that? No, but if it's gonna happen, that's a possibility. Uh, thank you, Professor. Just picking up on something that's been said in the audience from one of our uh, participants um, is the issue around both international uh, diplomacy and recognition of the Taliban, but also the economic challenges. I mean, we've um, very briefly talked about humanitarian aid, but then there's the economic side. Um, as we've seen recently, uh, that with traditional uh, Western aid and support sort of dwindling, uh, what role do you think China is playing uh, with its Belt and Road Initiative in Afghanistan? They have been investing quite heavily on infrastructure projects with the Taliban uh, and other countries uh, are playing their part here as well. And then that sort of, in some ways, connects to the matter of uh, recognition. Um, uh, you know, we've seen uh, over the last uh, two years uh, or more, the Taliban are incredibly hungry for recognition uh, as a legitimate uh, government uh, of Afghanistan. Um, but they, you know, there have been no signals of any change in policy from the Europe, from the UK, from, from the US. And so they might be turning elsewhere for their support. What do you what do you foresee this? Uh, and how, how do you think this is going to be shaped? They would certainly like to turn to support. Many countries, including China, have sent ambassadors but have not recognized the country. So it's a very strange, our government, very strange. Um, sort of limbo and Afghan embassies are still staffed by the old regime, but they carry out Taliban business, right? The UN seat, the Taliban don't, don't control. So a lot of people see, all right, China will step in, Belt and Road Initiative. But the Belt and Road Initiative is maybe past its sell-by date. Many countries have said, now we've got these debts and got these airports or rail systems that are not really useful. But if we look at the large investment that China has put into Pakistan in the Belt and Road system, it, the Pakistan military has devoted a lot of resources to protecting those Chinese projects. Because particularly when they get in Northwest Frontier or Baluchistan, these are areas that uh, have had insurgencies, so they're, they're sort of insecure. And one of the problems that China has is China is very sensitive to its projects being attacked, to Chinese citizens being killed. So security is extremely important to them. So coming into Afghanistan, that presents a problem. Even if they can cooperate with the Taliban, the Taliban still have to deal with the Islamic State, which is blowing up things right and left. So from the Chinese point of view is actually, can you really guarantee us security. Uh, I think a few months ago, and it might have been IS, it wasn't clear who, uh, there was a bombing in a hotel that was a center of sort of Chinese businessmen and stuff. It was sort of a signal to the Chinese, you can come here, but it's not necessarily all that safe. Um, 
But the bigger thing is in terms of, we're talking billions of dollars to really, and the Chinese have, Afghanistan is not an intrinsically poor country. It has tremendous resources, none of which were developed in the past 20 years. You know, for all the talk of the United States going into Afghanistan because it wanted the oil and minerals, you didn't see a single Western country investing capital in Afghanistan, either on petroleum, gas, or this great lithium there. There's iron, there's copper, all of which requires infrastructure. And there's a problem of China thinking, well, on 10 or 20 years to put that in and develop these mines and other things, it, can we guarantee stability in Afghanistan? But will, will the government, if we put billions of dollars into Afghanistan, loans to the Taliban, if another government comes in, will they renounce those loans? Say, thanks a lot, China, we're not paying. Um, China already has a lot of bad debts. It's not clear that Afghanistan would be, be prone to pay back. The other problem uh, with sort of the, the Belt and Road Initiative is that the Chinese, although they talk about, the PRC talks about its outreach to other countries, is dealing with a very conservative Islamic regime at the same time it's practicing what the UN has labeled genocide against the Uyghurs. The Uyghurs practice one of the milder forms of, of Islam there, you know. The fact that Xi Jinping has created concentration camps because he sees Islam itself as a danger to China. How do you repress Uyghurs in Xinjiang across the border from Afghanistan and deal with the Taliban? How do you square that circle? Okay, because the Taliban are the stuff of Xi Jinping's nightmares. So to the extent do you stabilize a Taliban regime, some of whom may say next stop Urumqi, um, that's a dilemma for, you know, for some extent, the Chinese may cynically think that the Americans deliberately pulled out of Afghanistan to leave them with a mess because the U.S. lives on the other side of the world. China lives next door. And sort of, yeah, great, China. There's minerals for you to exploit. Why don't you rush in? And then watch what happens. You know, that from a cynical Chinese point of view is like, did the Americans do this on purpose? Because when the Chinese were investing in Afghanistan, $3 billion for the INOC, for the rights for the INOC copper mine, um, it was the US and NATO that were making Afghanistan safe for Chinese investment. Now, no one is making Afghanistan safe for anyone's investment. Does China have the capacity to make Afghanistan safe for investment? It's not even sure it can get that kind of security in Pakistan. And Afghanistan may be a bridge too far. So I, I find the interest in Afghanistan by the Chinese very interesting, but I think it puts them on the horns of more dilemmas than the West faces, different dilemmas. They're not concerned about the humanitarian aspects of this, but the contradictions in their own policies, how they treat Muslims in Xinjiang, and their concern about security and stability. There's no great Taliban dictator that they can invite to Beijing and say, don't worry, guys, I'll take care of this. Thank you, Professor. Um, those are definitely um, points that have been on people's minds, but you don't tend to hear that side uh, of Afghanistan's politics very often, particularly the interest of other parties in the region and what a mess uh, it could create uh, to, to have any dealings with, with the Taliban. Um, I'm, I've, I've already started taking some questions from the audience throughout uh, the discussion, but there's one um, that I've seen asked quite frequently, uh, not only by um, people from Afghanistan who are living, who are now living in exile, but um, foreigners as well, in terms of why are Muslim-led countries. Um, Afghanistan is, uh, neighboring countries are predominantly Islamic countries, but also the region more generally, the Middle East, Central Asia, uh, South Asia. Why are they not uh, showing any interest in assisting Afghanistan with this crisis? Um, and why um, are we not seeing any sort of opposition by Muslim-led countries uh, against the Taliban's restrictive and harsh rule, uh, uh, Islamic rule of its people? I think partially, and this has been one of Afghanistan's problems, like where do you even put it in the world? 
Is it part of the Middle East? If it is, it's the easternmost part of the Middle East. Is it part of Central Asia? Well, a lot of people say Central Asia, that's Soviet Central Asia. Should we only include Northern Afghanistan? And then the US State Department, I put it in South Asia. And yeah, Pakistan is up to the Khyber Pass. That's definitely South Asia. But you're heading towards the Hindu Kush. Is that really South Asia? So Afghanistan is this link, which in historic times, that's what made it wealthy, center of so-called Silk Route. You know, it was like, it was, it was the marshalling yard for, you want to go from Iran to India, you went via Afghanistan. You want to go from Central Asia to India via Afghanistan. If you're the Mughal Empire, you want to control Kabul, so you can't be invaded. I mean, it's, it had interactions with everybody. But the other thing is, in terms of, even if we look at Iran, Afghan policy is, they barely recognize that Afghanistan is their neighbor. They have to be reminded periodically. They're focused on Iraq. Uh, they're focused on sort of Russia and the Caspian Sea. But if you, even under the Shah's Iran, the idea, well, Afghanistan is a neighbor, came as an afterthought. The, the, the Islamic Republic has a problem in terms of a radical Sunni regime, to what extent does that mean radical Shia? But they, but Iran these days has enough other problems without taking on one that isn't in their backyard yet. Um, and there are also people in Iran that are talking about deporting Afghans that have lived there for generations back to Afghanistan. If we look at Central Asia, they've always looked upon Afghanistan as something, even though it's the same ethnic groups, hasn't been them because they were part of the Russian Empire and Tsarist Empire and then the Soviet Union for so long that culturally they're quite distinct. The legacy of 70 years of Soviet rule. If you visit Samarkand, Bukhara, Tashkent, the ethnic groups may be the same, but they think entirely different than their compatriots on the other side of the border. The country that was most interested is Pakistan. But Pakistan's now at odds with the Taliban government. So they're there. But the interesting thing that they fear is that India may see an opportunity to make friends with the Taliban. Because people don't remember that the only country to vote to vote against Pakistan's admission into the United Nations was Afghanistan on the grounds it was an illegitimate state. That's getting you off to a bad start for the new country. But the fear of Pakistan, particularly they send back all these people, is that Kabul has always found it easier to deal with Delhi than it has with Islamabad, even though you would think, well, shouldn't it be easier to deal with your Muslim brothers than Hindu India? Not for the Afghans, um, playing sort of power politics off. So one of the things in terms of regional influence is you may see a return of more Indian influence, a, a real surprise in some senses, because they have nothing in common with the Taliban ideologically. But at the moment, the way Pakistan is acting, they both have a common, or potentially, the, if, the, if, if the Taliban see Pakistan as an enemy, who's going to help you out? India. And India, being a good friend of Iran, and paying for the, the Indians built the road from Charbahar, the port in the, the, the modern port in the Persian Gulf, all the way to the Afghan border. So as long as Iran and India are getting along, one could see Indian aid flowing into Afghanistan via Iran. And this is why it's almost a kaleidoscope, is that people are looking, George Bush was sort of a Manichaean, you're with us or against us. In Afghanistan, what's the issue that's involved? And I would have put money two years ago. Yeah, this is going to be a Pakistan-dominated government. And turns out not only not dominated, it's not even sympathetic. If it's not sympathetic, then people in Delhi are saying, maybe we can do business with those people oh, in the true real politic kind of way. So, um, yeah, uh, the more people that you add, Depends on the circumstances. Surprises are in store for all. 
just following the point you just uh, you sort of alluded to on Pakistan, um, I'm seeing a few questions around uh, the real dynamic between Pakistan and Afghanistan um, and how we can say they can be at odds when the Taliban's origins comes from from Pakistan's and the, the sort of the training and, and the center of Taliban, uh, particularly over the last 20 years where they sort of regrouped and formed uh, their resistance uh, and their overthrow of of Kabul's um, Republican uh, uh, government was through Pakistan. So a lot of questions are coming out is how is there some sort of a disagreement between the two when many actually think that the Taliban's um, overthrow uh, or takeover of Afghanistan was was through Pakistan? I, I would agree with those people. Um, and what I would say is that... Uh... Afghanistan has been constantly surprising Pakistani governments, right? When the United States threatened to invade Afghanistan, it did not immediately put the Taliban on a terrorist list, put Al-Qaeda on a terrorist list. And it told Mullah Omar and the Taliban, you give us or get rid of Osama bin Laden, he's our target, not you. The Pakistanis desperately tried to convince Mullah Omar, as did some of his own people, he's not an Afghan. Get rid of him. Because Pakistan said, if you don't get rid of him, the Americans will be here. That is bad for you. It will destroy your government, but it'll be horrible for us. 30 years of creating a greater Pakistan or making us a regional power will suddenly have the United States on our border. And they might never leave. That was their fear. Um, and Mullah Omar refused. Okay, that's when the Pakistanis revealed, re re discovered in 2001, when their interests were most at stake. Sacrifice bin Laden, we don't care what sympathies you have. Real politics says get rid of him. He's not an Afghan. And the Americans will be satisfied. And he didn't do it. And the regime fell. 20 years of Pakistan's work from the time of Zia al-Haq supporting the Mujahideen, aiding the Afghan to get rid of the communist government, supporting a Mujahideen government. All of this was to create, and during the early 2000s, Pakistanis sometimes referred to Afghanistan as their fifth province. This alienated a lot of the Afghans. Yeah, but that was Af you know, Pakistan's fifth province. 2001, that stopped. So they go back. But what the lesson they didn't learn is that Afghan proxies are relatively easy to control when they're in Pakistan and they haven't taken a government. But once they're in Afghanistan, they become Afghans again. And actually, from Pakistan's point of view, what ungrateful people. We put you in power. And now even our most vital interests, you refuse to respect. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a great disappointment, um, to, to Pakistan, but people are correct. Pakistan invested in this and I certainly see them as one of the major factors for the Taliban growing, coming to power. But the great irony is that victory allowed the Taliban to jettison Pakistan because what can Pakistan do for them? Pakistan has no money. What? The Taliban need are billions of dollars of aid. Pakistan is broke. It can't provide that aid. It's cheap to fund an insurgency. It is expensive to fund a government. So Pakistan could fund a robust insurgency by diverting, I have to say, a lot of American money. But um, once the Taliban had won, then it did not have the capacity to build Afghanistan, invest in Afghanistan. Countries like India and China, they do. Iran, they do. But Pakistan, from an economic point of view, was sort of a liability. And to the extent that Afghanistan went back to its old policies of thinking about Pashtunistan, areas in Pakistan where the Pashtuns live, as potentially independent, we go back to the 50s and 60s in which Afghanistan uh, was seen by Pakistan as a center of insurgency to break up the country. So you know, if, you, if you look back essentially from the founding of Pakistan, 
there's been this this backwards and forwards of Pakistan wanting to get security by controlling Afghanistan. And the great irony is the two times that it got that, it blew up in their face. Well, look, we've had an incredibly interactive audience. Um, questions keep uh, flying or flowing in. Um, and I don't think I'll be able to take uh, most of them, but I think I'll somewhat end on a final note, um, particularly around the global attention shift that we've seen on Afghanistan over the last uh, you know, months and, and two years. Um, once at the forefront of international discourse, it's now falling off the radar with bigger conflicts elsewhere drawing global attention. Um, I'd love to hear your opinion, Professor, on what the consequences of the shift uh, will be for Afghanistan, the wider region, and how can sustained international engagement be encouraged uh, in such a scenario? Afghanistan both benefits and suffers from sustained uh, international attention. As I said, it got its infrastructure built in the 50s and 60s, taking advantage of the Cold War with the Soviets build one set of roads, let the Americans build another. Um, but the interesting thing, and this goes back to the 19th century, Afghanistan is always written off as a place you can ignore. Uh, in the British press in the 19th century, there was a term called Afghanistanism. Then in British politics, if you wanted to bring up an irrelevant issue, you brought up Afghanistan. It's called Afghanistan. And it's a, at the tabloids would talk about Afghanistan and the intellectuals would say, we've got bigger things to worry about. The interesting thing is from the 19th century into the 21st century, Afghanistan for different reasons has always come back at the center of the world stage and you would never think it happened, all right? In the 19th century, it was the rivalry between the British in India and the Russians in Central Asia. That's why we have so many archives and other things in, in, in Britain, is because British politics and two Anglo-Afghan wars, you know, was this was a difficult area. Britain was unable to control it. How do we keep the Russians out? It, it just, Afghanistan never left, you know, the world stage on that. With after the world first world war, Afghanistan becomes independent, and in 1923, it is the only independent Muslim country in the world with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. You think, okay, not going to hear anything about that. And then post World War II, what we find is Cold War coming in. Suddenly, Afghanistan takes on this larger than life. But then we have particularly with the, the Mujahideen in the Soviet Union, both the Saudi Arabians and the Americans put a billion dollars a year, proxy war fighting Afghanistan. So suddenly Afghanistan becomes the center of a world attention, some ways bloodletting in Afghanistan that the Afghans, for fights the Afghans weren't interested in. Communists versus capitalists, you know, United States versus the Soviet Union. Uh, Afghan blood was spilled over these issues that domestically in Afghanistan didn't matter. It could have been resolved. Then in the 21st century, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the United States pulls all of its resources, not only out of Afghanistan, it gets out of Pakistan on the grounds, it will never be back in this region again. Come 2001, suddenly it's there. Right now, the United States thinks we're never going to be back there. We've got wars in the Middle East. We've got wars in Ukraine. We've got all kinds of problems. Afghanistan falls off the radar screen. But the great danger of the international community forgetting about Afghanistan is that it always comes back in some surprising way. So for the international community to neglect Afghanistan, one would say historically, is very short-sighted because you believe you can ignore Afghanistan, but Afghanistan will not ignore you. Not necessarily the Afghans, but some groups in Afghanistan, or if it's if it is if there's anarchy there, we saw groups like Al Qaeda before. You know, whatever happens in Afghanistan, particularly in terms of regional stability, Afghanistan has largely and importantly been sort of a linchpin country. So the it it doesn't necessarily determine what's going to happen, but it's a bellwether 
of what happens. And one of the problems is for 20 years, Afghanistan was stable under the Republic, and now it isn't. At a time in the world where there's a lot of instability. And the question, well, what happens in South Asia? What happens in Central Asia? Even in Iran, Afghanistan sits in the middle of that. So I would argue that it's important to keep a focus on Afghanistan, but also to realize that the Afghanistan in people's imagination is not the 21st century Afghanistan. They have the idea of the Mujahideen, people going to the mountains, a largely illiterate population. Afghanistan today, even under the Taliban, everybody has cell phones. The Taliban govern using WhatsApp. <laughs> if they ever lost that, they would be unable to send instructions. Right? So it, it's a country in some ways that looks old fashioned, stuck in the past, but in some ways is one of the most modern 21st century societies, particularly in terms of the youth of its population, its adoptions of technology, and now because of the internet, connections with the wider world that it never had before. So I would say in terms of looking at this, the West, the United States in particular, ignores Afghanistan as its peril because it may look like you can leave it alone, but you would be well advised to try to intervene to make better things happen in order to preempt better things from coming about. Well, what a uh, better note to end on than the quote you've just uh, mentioned. Um, you think you can ignore Afghanistan, but Afghanistan will not ignore you. Absolutely. Right. History has shown this to uh, time and time again that Afghanistan cannot be ignored. And it is disheartening, unfortunately, that it reaches this heights and this level of oppression and darkness uh, for some sort of resistance uh, to be formed against it. But you're absolutely right as well that this is a very different Afghanistan than, than the one in the late 1990s when the Taliban first uh, were in power. And I do hope that conversations like this bring Afghanistan back on the radar. First of all, I'd like to thank you so much, Professor. You've had a very long history with the country. Uh, you've dedicated so much time, research uh, and interest uh, into uh, understanding Afghanistan, and you've brought the world uh, much closer to understanding the political, the history, the cultural, uh, the religious dynamics of the country, which are incredibly complex. Um, so I'd like to thank you for joining us uh, again. I think the last time we, we spoke was just before the Taliban takeover um, and your our conversation was definitely a big hit. A lot of people did come back to us and say, we want to hear more from Professor Thomas, Thomas Barfield. He's one of the most insightful people we've heard and who is blunt and honest about what's going on in the country. So thank you again. And I do hope that this conversation uh, was uh, of interest to, to so many of you who have joined us here today. Um, if there are any questions, any follow-up questions that you would like uh, answers to, please do send them our way. And we will, of course, um, uh, ask Professor Thomas Barfield to, to contribute to those uh, questions uh, offline as well. But this video will be hopefully uploaded on YouTube so you can uh, listen to it in your own time. And if uh, I do hope that this conversation does help fuel more ideas uh, and uh, conversations about the way forward and what alternatives we can provide for Afghanistan and what and what that helping hand really looks like. But thank you so much again. And um, I'll let you go, Professor Barfield. We've taken enough of your time this evening. But thank you again. And um, I do hope that we'll be able to speak again very soon. Thank you so much. Thank you.